more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. going to get well, Marianne. I'm not going to die. I feel disappointed. No. No, it's not true. It's not. Now, though he couldn't see her face through the hot blur of fever, he could hear her crying, sobbing and shaking with her fist pressed tight against her teeth. Such a fool. On the eighth morning, Marius woke full of strange, fiery brilliance as if all his flesh were glass not yet cooled from the furnace. He knew the fever was worse, close to its crisis, and yet it no longer had the quality of darkness and mists. Everything was sharp and clear. The red of his necktie hanging in the corner of the bureau mirror was aflame. He could hear the minutest stirrings down in the kitchen, the breaking of a matchstick in Marianne's fingers as clear as a pistol shot outside her bedroom window. It was a joy. Marius wondered for a moment if he might have died. But if it was death, it was certainly more pleasant than he had ever imagined death would be. He could rise from the bed without any sense of weakness. And he could stretch his arms. And he could even walk out through the solid door into the upstairs hall. He thought it might be fun to tiptoe downstairs and give Mary Hannah a fight. But when he was in the parlor, he remembered suddenly that she would be unable to see him. Then... When he heard her coming from the kitchen with his medicine, he decided to return. With the speed of thought, Marius was back in his body under the quilt again, and Marianne was coming into the bedroom with her large eyes wide and worried. She was such a fool, he thought. It had begun that way. It had been so easy, he wondered why he had never discovered it before. Within a few hours, the fever broke in great rivers of sweat. And by Wednesday... Marius was able to sit up in a chair. By the end of the month, he was back to work, editor of the Daily Argus. But even those who knew him least were able to detect in the manner of Marius Lindsley that he was a changed man and a worse one. And those who knew him best wondered how so malignant a citizen, such a confirmed and studied misanthrope as Marius, could possibly change into anything worse than he was. Some said that typhoid always burned the temper from the toughest steel, and that Marius' mind had been left a dark and twisted thing. At prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, the wives used to watch Marius' young wife and wonder how she endured her cross. She was such a pretty thing. One afternoon in September, as he dozed in the bulging leather couch of his office, Marius decided to try it again. The secret, he knew, lay somewhere on the brink of sleep. If a man knew that, any man, then he would know what Marius did. It was more than a minute later that Marius knew that all he would have to do to leave his body behind was to get it from the couch. Presently, he was standing there, staring down at his heavy, middle-aged figure sunk deep into the cracked leather of the couch. I'm not dead, he thought. But here's my soul, my blasted, immortal soul, standing looking at its body. It was as simple as shedding a shoe. Marius smiled to himself. He would keep his secret even from Mary Ann, especially from Mary Ann. It would be fun to use as a trick, a practical joke, to set fools like his wife at their wit's edge. If only he could move things. If only the filmy substance of his soul could grasp a tumbler and send it shattering at Marianne's feet in the kitchen floor some morning. Or treat a copy boy's nose. Or snatch a cigar from the teeth of Judge John Robert Gantz as he strolled home some quiet evening. Well, it was, after all, a matter of will, Marius decided. It was his own powerful and indomitable will that had made the trick possible in the first place. He walked to the edge of his desk and grasped at the letter opener on the dirty ancient blotter. His fingers were like wisps of fog that blew through a screen door. He tried again, willing it all his power, grasping again and again at the small brass dagger until at last it moved a fraction of an inch. A little more. 
On the next try, it lifted four inches in the air and hung there for a second on its point before it dropped. Maria spent the rest of the afternoon practicing until at last he could lift the letter opener in his fist and drive it through the blotter so deeply that it bit into the wood of the desk beneath. Marius giggled in spite of himself and hurried around the office, picking things up like a pleased child. He lifted a tumbler off the dusty water cooler and stared laughing at it, hanging there in the middle of nothing. At that moment, he heard a copy boy coming for the proofs of the morning editorials, and Marius flitted quickly back into the cloak of his flesh. Nor was he a moment too soon. Just as he opened his eyes, the door opened, and he heard the drinking glass shatter on the floor. That evening, Marius said, I'm going to take a nap before supper, Mary Ann. Very well, said Mary Ann. He watched her young, unhappy figure disappearing into the gloom of the kitchen, and he smiled to himself again, thinking what a fool she was, his wife. He could scarcely wait to get to the Davenport and stretch out in the cool, dark parlor with his head on the beaded pillow. Now, thought Marius, now. And in a moment, he had risen from his body and hurried out into the hallway, struggling to suppress the laughter that would tell her he was coming. He heard her voice and was puzzled. She was saying... Oh, you must go. You mustn't ever come here when he's home. I've told that before, Jim. What would you do if he woke up and found you here? Marius rushed to her side, careful not to touch her, careful not to let either of them know he was there, listening, looking, flaming hatred growing slowly inside of him. The man was young and dark and well-built and clean-looking. He leaned against the half-open screen door, holding Marianne's free hand between his own. His round, dark face bent to hers, and she smiled with a tenderness and passion that Marius had never seen before. And the man said, I know. I know all that. But I can't sit thinking about him beating you up that time. He might do it again, Marianne. He might. He's worse, they say, since he had the fever. Crazy, I think. I've heard him say he's crazy. Look, don't put it off anymore. Run away tonight. We can take a steamboat to Louisville, and you can get a divorce, and you never have to put up with him again. I got two tickets for Louisville right here in my pocket on the Nancy B. Turner. Lord, Marianne, don't make me suffer like this, thinking all the time about him coming at you with his cane and beating you, maybe killing you. The woman grew silent, and her face softened, and then she whispered, All right. All right, I'll do it. I'll go. Quick. All right, you meet me at the wharf at nine. Tell him that you're going to a prayer meeting. You'll never suspicion anything. All right. All right. Now go, please. And he walked away, his heels ringing boldly on the bricks, lighting a cigarette, the match arching like a shooting star into the darkness of the shrubs. Marianne stood stiff for a moment in the shadow of the porch, her large eyes full of tears. Marius drew back to let her pass. He stood and watched her for a moment before he hurried back into the parlor and lay down again within his flesh and bone in time to be called for supper. Later, Marius went down to the dock and, searching the passenger list for the Nancy B. Turner, discovered that Marianne and the man had reserved two staterooms, number three and number four. Marius asked for stateroom number five, next to the room that was to be occupied by Jim O'Toole, the man Marianne was running away with. Marius was on the boat early, struggling with his small horsehair trunk, and presently he was in his stateroom. At nine o'clock, a man and a woman hurried up the gangplank together. The water lapped and gurgled against the wharf, and... Off over the river, lightning scratched the dark rim of the mountains like the sudden flare of a kitchen match. Marius lay in his bunk. He had stiffened as he heard Marianne's excited murmur suddenly just outside his stateroom door and the voice of the man answering her, comforting her. Lightning flashed and flickered out again over the Ohio hills and lit the river for one clear moment. Marius saw all of his stateroom etched suddenly in silver from the open porthole. The mirror, the washstand, bowl, and pitcher. The horsehair trunk beside him on the floor. 
Marius smiled to himself, thinking how easy it would be, wondering why no one had thought of such a thing before. Marius rose and slipped past the sleeping porter, making his way for the white-painted handrail at the head of the stairway. Once, Marius laughed aloud to himself as he realized that there was no need to tiptoe with no earthly substance there to make a sound. He crept down the narrow stairway to the gallery. The Negro cook sat around the long wooden table eating their supper. Marius slid his long shadow along the wall toward the row of kitchen knives lying freshly washed and home on the zinc table by the pump. He chose the longest of them all and the sharpest, a knife that would shear the ham clean from the hog with one quick upward sweep. In an instant, Marius swept the knife from the zinc table and darted into the gloomy companionway. The porter was still asleep, and Marius laughed to himself to imagine the man's horror at seeing the butcher knife, its razor edge flashing bright in the dull light, inching itself along the wall. But it was a joke he couldn't afford. He bent at last and slipped the knife cautiously along the threadbare rug under the little ventilation space beneath the stateroom door. And then, rising, so full of hate that he was half afraid he might shine forth in the darkness, Marius passed through the door and picked the knife quickly again in his hand. He stepped carefully across the worn rug toward the sleeping body on the bunk. He felt so gay and light, he almost laughed aloud. In a moment, it would be over. And there would be one full-throated cry, and Mary Ann would come beating on the locked door, and when she saw her lover, <laughs> with an impatient gesture, Marius lifted the knife. His arm flashed. It was done. Fainting with excitement, he leaned in the darkness to brace himself. His hand came to rest on the harsh, rough surface of the horsehair trunk. Oh, my Lord, screamed Marius. Good Lord, I'm in the wrong room. The wrong room. And he clawed with fingers of smoke at the jetting fountain of his own blood. is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? 